This is the sound of a pygmy nuthatch in the redwood forest. They are small birds with large heads and a short beak. Their breast is a soft white and their head and wings are a soft light gray. Hi, I'm Deborah with Save the Redwoods League and today we are going to go for a hike through the El Corte Madera Creek Open Space Preserve. This is a beautiful almost 3,000 acre preserve that is owned by the Mid Peninsula Open Space District and it is a beautiful redwood preserve and today we're going to talk a little bit about redwood resilience. There's been a lot of fires going on recently specifically in redwood forests and a lot of people are worried about these parks and preserves and these trees and we're going to talk about how these forests can be so resilient during a time of fire. So come with me as we walk through the preserve. There is a trailhead sign that says 0.5 miles to the Ohan Trail. And Deborah, our expert guide, is walking slowly on a trail that is wide enough for a truck to drive down. This is one of the trails that used to be a logging road. There are green ferns and second growth redwoods on either side of the trail. Deborah and I walk on the Ohan Trail, which is narrower and only has room for one person at a time. The left side of the trail has an uphill and the right side has a steep downhill. There are a lot of young trees along the trail. Next, we pass a 100-year-old redwood tree on our right. We can see sunlight shining through the breaks in the green needles of the tree branches. So here we have a very common coast redwood um, forest species, which is tan oak. And it is actually not a true oak, although it has the word oak in the name. Um, and it was used by Native Americans. It does produce acorns. And so they used it as food. They used it medicinally as well, parts of it. Um, it kind of has a smooth feel to it if you um, get a chance to touch it. And one of the things about tan oak is that it actually is very susceptible to sudden oak death. And that is a disease, it's a water mold that has been spreading throughout California and it will kill often a lot of tan oak. And what happens is then you have a lot of tan oak on the forest floor that is dead. So there are a lot of people that are working on studying a little bit more of this disease. Um, but it has been causing issues and it changes the dynamic of the forest when we have a lot of tan oak death. So let's keep walking. As we walk down another fairly wide trail, we notice a lot of brown needles on the ground that are needles that fell from the trees and dried. If you roll them between your fingers, it feels similar to rolling grains of rice between your fingers. So this preserve was logged during, starting in the 1860s, all the way up until when it became a preserve in the 1980s. And we see evidence of logging, just like over here, where we have some different stumps that show that there was logging that happened in this area. Now we can see that the redwoods have become very resilient and have grown up 
since this logging happened. And all of these trees that you see around here are second growth forests. So that means these trees are anywhere between 100, 150 years old and have grown up since the logging happened. A lot of the trails that you walk on when you come to this preserve are old logging roads that they have converted into trails. So even though this forest was once cut and heavily impacted, it has grown back and become this amazing second growth redwood forest that we can enjoy today. We hear a chestnut-backed chickadee, which is another small bird that has a dark brown mask around its eyes and a rusty colored outer body. Deborah stands in front of a four foot wide redwood and picks up a small tree branch that has lichen on it. It looks like light green colored lettuce growing around parts of the branch. It feels soft to the touch. So here we have lichen. And lichen is actually, actually a, a symbiotic relationship between a fungus and a bacteria. So the part that you see is the fungus and the bacteria are kind of inside and they help each other out to be able to produce food and to grow and lichen are very common in forests and grow on almost any type of substrate so whether it be branches or cement or uh, rocks they grow on just about everything but they often need a very stable substrate to grow on. So redwood trees, the trunk of redwood trees, you actually only see two types of lichen that grow on the trunk. One is this greenish lichen called dust lichen. And it's because the trunks of redwood trees flake off a lot. So they're not a very sturdy substrate for lichen to grow up. You will find a lot of lichen up in the canopy and on the upper branches, which is more stable, but down on the trunk, you only see a few different types. The next time you're hiking through the forest and you see some lichen on a redwood tree, you should investigate it and see what you can find. After walking further on the trails, we pass three large Pacific Madrone trees that are about 30 feet tall. They have heavy, irregularly shaped branches coming out of their trunk, and if you look closely, their rough red bark is peeling in many places. We can hear a hairy woodpecker drumming in the background. Their favorite trees are Pacific Madrones. Hairy woodpeckers have a red patch on the top of their head, a black mask over their face, a black and white pattern on their wings, and a bright white breast. A close-up look at the madrone reveals orange-red bark that peeled off in large thin scales to expose a smooth green trunk underneath. The peeled off bark feels like curls of paper. So when we are in a forest, how do we even know that these trees are redwood trees. It's often very difficult to be able to identify trees from the ground. The majority of what you're gonna see is the trunk here. And if you feel a redwood trunk, it feels very spongy. It has this reddish brown color to it. And it kind of, the bark flakes off a little bit. You can see some examples of where bark has come off. Um, and it has this general, somewhat ridgy um, aspect to it. But a lot of it really is the soft, spongy nature of, these, of this bark. And another way that redwoods are so resilient, especially to fire, is their really thick bark. Redwoods can have up to a foot thick of bark. And we think of it as 
like a shield on a space shuttle. It protects the tree from the fire so that even if the thick bark burns, which it's meant to, it won't penetrate in to the inner area, the living tissue of the tree to actually burn the tree and kill it itself. So next time you're in a redwood forest, make sure to touch the very spongy bark of hairy bark of a redwood tree. Another way to be able to identify redwood trees is from the very smooth and flat green redwood needles that you see. Have you ever made redwood shortbread cookies? Deborah told me about a co-worker of hers who gathered fresh redwood needles and added them to her shortbread cookies. The little green needles give the cookies a nice sprinkle of green color. A redwood tree fell across the trail, so it was cut in half by a park maintenance person, which means we can see the inside of its trunk. This is a great example of looking at the different parts of a redwood tree. So here you can see how thick this bark is. And again, the thick bark helps make the tree resilient and resist fire when it comes through. This white inner part is called the sapwood and that helps transport some of the water in the tree. And then this inner red part is called the heartwood and that is dead plant material and it's really the structure and the heart of the redwood. And that's partially where redwoods get their name is from this red inner heartwood area. And this heartwood is the area that stores the carbon. So redwoods are known to store more carbon than any other forest in the planet. So redwood forests can store a lot of the carbon and they're taking it out of the atmosphere and storing it here in the heartwood. And you can see, even as a redwood tree falls, it decomposes very slowly. So that carbon is staying in the wood of the tree and not getting released back into the atmosphere. So we like to think of our really big old growth redwoods, but even these second growth redwoods as part of the climate change solution. They are taking that carbon, storing it in their wood, and helping to keep it out of our atmosphere. We see a young golden crowned sparrow on the left side of the trail that is standing on a rock. It's light brown and has a long tail. Because it's young, it doesn't yet have a bright yellow forehead. It is feeding on seeds and insects it finds on the ground. So here's another great example of the heartwood and the sapwood and the bark of the tree. And this heartwood is what makes redwood trees so valuable for timber. Is you can see how much of the tree is heartwood and this is the part that the logging companies want and that they use for timber and for decking in houses. Now, if you look really closely, you can see some of the tree rings. And a redwood tree and all trees actually here in Northern California will put on one ring of growth every single year. And so you can see a darker ring and a lighter ring. And that is for the different growing seasons. The lighter ring is for the wet season when it grows a lot. And the darker ring is during the drier season when it grows a little bit. So you can tell often the age of a tree by counting its rings. We also have scientists that look at these trees and study the rings to look at growth patterns and to give us an idea of how these trees have grown in the past and it can help tell us how they may grow in the future with all the changes in climate that we have going on. So we like to study the rings 
Redwood trees are notorious for being very difficult to study their rings. Sometimes you can see they're very narrow and sometimes they are very wide. And it can tell us, was there a very wet year and the tree grew a lot that year? Or is it a very narrow tree ring and maybe that indicates a drought. So just by looking at the rings, you can tell a lot about a tree's life and the life of the forest. As we walk further down the trail, we find a tan oak seed that is the shape and size of a large green olive. We also find a huge redwood tree stump that is covered with bright green moss. Okay. So this is a perfect example of a cut redwood. It was logged again around probably the 1860s and you can see how massive these trees were. But surrounding this log tree, you can see the resilience of these redwood forests. And one of the ways that make redwood so resilient is the way that they reproduce. And they reproduce from sprouts. One way is that they reproduce from these sprouts that come up from the base of the tree. So if a tree is cut down or is injured in some way, the tree will then send out baby sprouts from its base that will eventually grow up to be the tall redwoods that we see today. Um, they also rely on seeds for reproduction, but these sprouts is one way that make redwood trees so resilient. Here we have a great example of fire. Redwoods have lived with fire for a very long time. Native Americans that occupied this area before had fire was a part of their landscape and they actively burned the forest to be able to allow for new growth and for some food production. And so again, these redwoods are adapted to be with fire. And when we have remains of trunks of fire like this, this can often be really good habitat for a lot of different animals and is considered still part of the important landscape of this area. So one of the ways that fire is very beneficial to a forest is you can see all of these dead lower branches. And when a low intensity fire sweeps through, it will burn a lot of these lower branches to the ground. And it just helps then the tree have energy to produce and uh, put energy into producing uh, branches and leaves higher up. Again, down here on the ground, you can see there's been a huge buildup of dead plant material, branches and trees that have fallen down. And again, when a fire sweeps through here, a low intensity fire will burn all of this and recycle the nutrients back into the ground and provi provide that nutrients to the trees and any new plants. So fire is very important to the landscape. Deborah and I follow the crosscut trail and find more evidence of redwoods that were cut down in the 1860s. They have moss growing on the stump and the new redwood trees have grown next to the stump. The path takes us between two second growth redwood trees that are three to four feet in diameter. The forest has lush green bushes and ferns. Thick tree roots are growing across the trail. These are examples of redwood cones. So it's always so fascinating that the tallest trees in the world produce such small cones. And that is because, as I mentioned, they have a couple different ways that they reproduce. One way is through the seeds that come out of these cones. The other way is through the sprouts 
that come up from the base of trees. And this sprouting is a more common way for redwoods to reproduce. You can think that if you're a tiny redwood seed and you fall into the ground, you have to find sunlight to be able to germinate and grow. And redwood forests are known to be very shady, cool environments. So it can be difficult if you're a redwood seed to actually reproduce. So that's why redwoods are ingenious and have discovered a different way to reproduce to be able to continue to thrive and survive. And that is one, another example of how resilient they are. Um, especially after fire and logging impacts. I find a Douglas fir cone and compare it in size to the redwood cone. Douglas firs grow at most to 70 feet tall and their cone is three times the size of the redwood cone and redwoods grow up to 350 feet tall. We hear the sound of the yellow rumped warbler and Cassian's vario as we walk by a large patch of baby redwood trees that are three to four feet tall. Deborah finds a western sword fern and looks on the underside of its leaves to find small brown spores. We finally reach the sign that points in the direction of the one old growth redwood in the preserve. We can hear a Pacific Slope flycatcher calling in the background. Their wings and tail are dark brown and the rest of their body is a soft pale green. We see the old growth redwood tree and it has three horizontal scars across its trunk. Mike explains what these scars are from. A hundred years ago when they were going to cut this tree down, they cut a notch in the tree where they put a tow board in that they could stand on and then they go up to the next layer and they cut another bunch of tow boards and then they stand on those and then they start cutting the actual notch in the tree. And they cut halfway through and then they saw the rest of it and down it goes. So we are here standing beneath a beautiful old growth redwood tree and for some reason this tree was not cut when logging happened during this uh, preserve and in this forest and so it is here today resilient and standing strong and it could be hundreds even thousands of years old we really don't know. And just to show these redwood trees have withstood a lot of changes in our climate. A lot of changes in geology, a lot of changes in uh, climate that have been going on. And we have found that the old growth redwood forests, especially those in Northern California, can take in and store more carbon than any other forest on the planet. So we like to think of them as part of the climate change solution. So we need to be concerned about a lot of the fires that are sweeping through our forests and the changes that are happening in our world. But old growth trees give us hope and resilience that these forests are going to be able to survive and even thrive into the future. So this is a great example of a fire cavity. It is a result sometimes when a fire comes through and actually burns part of the tree but does not kill the tree. And this can actually be very good habitat for birds and for bats. Sometimes we call them goose pens because the explorers, when they were in this area, they used to store their geese in here and enclose it. But it's another way, way to show how fire can actually be beneficial in providing habitat and home for different animals. Another animal that makes its home in the redwood forests is the banana slug. Some interesting facts are that it's the largest North American land mollusk. They can grow up to 10 inches long, live up to seven years, and can move up to 6.5 inches per minute. 